you're going to find that the majority of very wealthy people are extremely conservative in how they invest. They don't need to beat the market. They've already done that. They just need to preserve their capital. Wealth means different things to different people. But when you are fortunate and you become wealthy, what you'll find is most of those people. What do you think are three things that rich people do differently than the poor people or people that aren't thinking about building wealth in that way? Number one, and you'll be surprised to hear me say this, they don't take inordinate risk. Um, you're going to find that the majority of very wealthy people are extremely conservative in how they invest. They don't need to beat the market. They've already done that. They just need to preserve their capital. So what you find them doing, and I don't know what that number is for you, wealth means different things to different people, but when you are fortunate and you become wealthy, what you'll find is most of those people do not take a lot of risk. Mm. And they, they, they invest in things that are very long term. They don't use a lot of debt in most cases. They don't use leverage when they're investing. They don't take very speculative positions on. You know, you hear that they might buy Bitcoin or they may, you know, uh, buy a speculative stock. But if you look at it as a percentage of what they're worth, it's nothing. Right. And, and so they're willing, with, with their, when they're making that investment, they're saying, I'm willing to lose it. It's entertainment almost for me. It's mm. not something I think it's that I'm going to have to live off. And the other thing I found, because I advise a lot of wealthy people, because my companies that I invest in, you know, of which I have over 30, at any one time, 10% of them are being acquired by a private equity firm or being bought by a strategic. And I've known the entrepreneur and maybe it's their first liquidity event. I try and help them on that journey. And some of them, you know, get a hundred million or eighty million dollars, we've got plenty of the situations like that, and they're young. And what happens is you find out later that entrepreneurs are actually really bad investors. They're very good at running a business and they focus myopically on that their whole lives, but when they actually get liquidity, it's usually their husband or wife that was the person that was taking care of the family and mitigating the risk. And they're the ones that are the better investor. And that's why I say in a family you have to have a team approach. But I've learned this, that you really, you, you'll find that what's successful about families is they know what they're good at, or wealthy people, and they know what they're not good at. And they don't try and do things they don't understand. Mm. And, and this is, this, it's important because you have to say, I have limits on my skills. I, I know what I'm good at, but I've been very fortunate and I'm not going to go risk anything now doing something I don't know. I see that um, characteristic a lot. And the other thing in the, that I would say is different, um, and this may have a lot to do with the concept of karma, mm. another lesson I learned from my mother, that if you're successful and you talk to wealthy people, you'll always find that there's something that motivates them to be philanthropic, to give money to something that matters to them. And that, that is, that's the whole idea of, of giving back You've been successful and you have to find the cause that motivates you. You're willing to spend your time and money supporting. That is a big difference because if you believe in karma, and I do, when you do that, it, it kind of protects you against the horrific downside of, of something bad happening to you because you're just so greedy. You, you, can't, you can't, when you had success and you're a wealthy person, if you show me a greedy wealthy person, just wait 10 years. Then you'll just show me a person somehow karma will separate their money from them. That's what I find. Or they'll get sick or something will happen where, yeah. I, 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 I really believe this. I, I really believe it. And you've got to find those things that you can give back on that mean something to you. But if, if, you, if you abuse karma, it's got a special gift coming for you. Mm. So finding ways to give back. Are you giving back in a lot of other ways, philanthropically right now as well? Yeah, you know, I am... I, um, I like to have a concentrated approach. I call it five and five. I prefer to pick five uh, charities, or in our mm -hmm. case, um, we support a, a, a dance a company. We support uh, some hospitals, some educational institutions, and uh, you know, give enough that it's a material gift, and that um, that I have a say in how it's spent. Very often, and above all, I like to see expense ratios reported. I generally don't support charities that can't provide, just like an investment, some kind of a statement on where my money went. Right. 
And, and that is actually something I think Bill Gates is famous for early on, saying, why can't I treat my charitable investments as I do my private ones and ask for some performance metrics? And I kind of believe that he's right. Yeah, it's thing is smart. And what would you say is one other thing that rich people do differently that poor people don't do? Um, this may have a lot to do with, you know, the access to, but in the last five years I've realized how important food is mm -hmm. and how if you're, you know, you say poor, how you should be, or me, even you should focus on what you put in your body. Because in our society we do two things very badly. We eat too much sodium and we eat too much sugar, white cane sugar. And we have been uh, trained to do that since the 40s by a whole industrial complex that wants to sell us that shit. And we eat it. And I'm guilty of it and so is everybody else. Salt and sugar feel good. They're comfort foods, snacks and all that. It's the worst thing you put in your body. And I have learned, it's, it's kind of weird, but the older I get and the more I experience this, because I'm, I'm actually a classically trained chef in French fusion. I, I wow. have a, a job on QVC as Chef Wonderful. I sell millions of dollars of food and wine each year there. It's because I grew up for a few years in, in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And that's a, at a place where it was a French colonized place. My dad was working in the United Nations and the two women that were the housekeepers and the cook used to go to the market. It was on the Mekong River in Phnom Penh and take me with them at four in the morning. And um, it's very hot there. And so they were classically trained French chefs. So in, in French cooking, particularly if you're a sous chef, which is really hard to get that designation, and I'm pretty proud of what I can do in that area, is you work with a lot of heavy butter and cream. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that in an in a, in a environment where it's 110 degrees at 100% humidity every day. You can't eat like that. So what, what those chefs taught me was how to replace the butter and the cream with things like a mango puree or lime and lemon juice or guava crushed. I mean, all kinds of different um, different flavors. That, uh, so they would take a classic dish like crepe flambe, which is, is uh, one of my specialties, or escargot. And, and you know, those are classic French dishes. They're very time consuming to make, particularly escargot if it's made properly, with real shells and real snails. But you don't have to put all that butter in it. You can have um, you know, a different flavor set based on using a fusion of, of, of citrus. And anyways, the whole idea of, of eating better for me is part of my DNA and growing up. So now I look at what I eat every day. I used to, when I was young, I'd, I'd eat three steaks a week. I used to love that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've had a piece of red meat in months. I eat fish, I eat fruit and vegetables, and it's, it really helps you feel better. So if you're asking me what's different, but I'm, I'm proud to see that many people are exploring plant-based and um, regardless of their, of their financial income, meat is actually very expensive and very inefficient. And there's ways to get protein. Now, you don't have to become a vegan. I'm just saying you have to choose to focus on the things that are better for you, mm -hmm. regardless of your income. And, and, and you will get more energy. You'll feel better. Um, that kind of thing. That's a difference as well. That's powerful. I love that. I'm curious. Do you think the middle class is financially stuck? And if so, what can they do to start achieving more financial freedom? No, they're not stuck. And one thing that's democratized, and we've learned it since this whole pandemic started, um, you can create a new opportunity for yourself online with virtually no barrier to entry. Uh, many, many people did it as a side hustle, and it's now producing more income than their first job. Mm -hmm. um, the whole idea of trying to solve for customer acquisition using creativity, using video, using music, using photography, using storytelling, animatics, graphics, to actually sell a service or product, starting locally and then expanding. There's millions of new businesses that have been started during the pandemic. We see them every day on Shark Tank, but they are basically taking middle class people out of middle class. They're, and I'd say, if you look at Shark Tank, we have plenty of people that have you know, been working in the middle class for years and all of a sudden exploded to the upside with a great service or idea that they did online. And that, that's why I, I really think people should empower themselves. You can try things online, you can see what works, you don't have to get the first one right. But those tools are there for you. 
Yeah. And most of this is done on Facebook in geolocked advertising. 80 cents on the dollar of what my company spend is on Facebook. So I always find it very wow. funny to see people, you know, bashing Facebook, saying how evil it is when really it's running small business in America because mm. they have that unique geolocking advertising feature. So, you know, we shouldn't shut it down until we find something better. Yeah. And what would you say are a couple of qualities that you really look for when you're when you're looking to invest in someone or when someone has an idea and you see, whether you invest them or not, you're like, this person's going to be successful, whether it's in this thing or something else. What are those two or three qualities that all of them seem to have in your mind, whether it be a leadership skill or uh, clarity? What would well, that be? I, I prefer to invest in entrepreneurs that have failed once or twice before, that have felt the sting of failure and have you know gone down the road and, and not had success the first time because their motivations are completely different than a more arrogant first-timer that thinks everything they do is going to make $100 million. It just not, doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing. I love, there's three things you have to have the ability to do and know if you're going to be successful in business. Number one is you have to be able to articulate your idea in 90 seconds or less. It explains to me why anybody would want that product or service. And if you take more than a minute and a half, you're never going to be successful. Mm -hmm. You're just not. And number two is you have to be able to explain why you're the right person to execute on that idea. In other words, what is it about you that knows how to take this idea, which good ideas are dime a dozen. Executional skills are really hard to find. So what is it about you that can execute on this business and make it work? I mean, those two together start to be really interesting because then as an investor looks at it and says, well, I'm going to mitigate my risk. I got a great executional you know, expert here and I've got a great idea. And then lastly, the one that I think you have to have a good command of, you have to know your numbers. You have to be able to explain gross margins, market share, break even analysis, how many competitors, how fast can you grow? And, and I think, you know, that's who I want to invest in, someone who has a command of all three of those. That's probably got more than a 50% chance of being successful if they can do that right. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I love your take on things. Uh, I wanted to know, for those that are in their late teens, early 20s, what conversations should they be having with friends or mentors around money? I feel like a lot of people are afraid to talk about it or they, yeah. don't, they don't share how much they make or how much a home costs or whatever. It's just like this hush-hush mentality. What should we be talking about in our late teens, early 20s, or even 30s, but what types of conversations should we be having to shift the narrative around money so we can start attracting it in our favor as opposed to rejecting it? Well, first of all, we need to teach it in high school. Luckily, here in Florida, it's been put into the curriculum, and I'm very proud of that. You know, I used to be in the educational software business. There's 110,000 school buildings in America, the majority of them in New York and Florida, Texas and California, and abysmally... Most of them don't teach even debt. They don't even teach how to use a credit card, which is ridiculous. We've got to change that, and luckily we are. We're starting to see it creep into the curriculums in all the major states, which is good. But I, I think parents have a responsibility to talk about money, which is always sitting at the table every day. It always is. And you know, getting their kids to understand how a credit card works is very important. And again, I talked about not entitling. That's important too. But within, within your friends, I mean... Don't be embarrassed to talk about money. You're going to be talking about money for the rest of your life. It's always going to be part. You can't live without it. You have to deal with it. It can cause great joy and give you personal freedom or can be catastrophic in your life, destroy your happiness completely. Your choice is where does it fit? Do you want it to destroy your life or would you prefer that you understand how it works and respect it for what it is and deal with it? That's a personal choice people have to make. And I would say the best way to do that is learn more, talk more about it, and don't be afraid to discuss it. I don't care what age you're at, but certainly at the age of 16, you should be discussing that. And above all, taking 10% of whatever anybody gives you, your grandmother, your birthday gift, whatever it is, and set it aside and start investing it. The earlier you start, the less pressure you have when you're in your 60s. Mm -hmm. Because you've got to have at least a million and a half bucks in the bank, and you can if you just save $100 a week. That's what Beanstalks is all about. That's why... That's why I got involved in being stocks. That's the whole idea. And do you think someone in their late 40s and 50s, do you think it's too late for them to start learning about financial literacy if they've 
struggled in their 20s and 30s and 40s? Do you think it's too late to start investing and saving? Uh, what should people do in their 40s and early 50s? No, they should at any age. I mean, the truth is um, changing your spending behavior in your 40s is difficult, but you can do it. And at that age, you should start saving 20 to 25% of what you're taking in, which sounds hard to do, but it isn't. You just stop buying those $5 coffees and you stop buying stuff you don't use. Anybody can go look in their closet and see all the crap they bought that they never used. And basically, you killed that money when you did that. You bought something that you could have had invested and it could have grown 6% to 8% a year for you, but instead you bought some piece of junk that you're throwing out now. Everybody's guilty of that. I actually think my mother was right. She's always said that people can save 20%. They just don't have the backbone to do it. And she did, and she died a very wealthy woman. She had a secret account she kept from both of her husbands. And I was the older brother and was the executor for the state. And I remember the lawyers calling me up saying, you gotta come down here. Your mother, your mother had a lot of money. Mm. And I always wondered how she did it. She basically bought dividend paying stocks in her 20s and a whole bunch of telco bonds, 50-50 portfolio. She loved telco bonds. They used to yield 6% in those days. And she loved dividend paying stocks, S&P stocks. And over the 50 years that she had this account, it just provided massive appreciation. Wow. Should people die wealthy or should they die broke because they spent their wealth on charity or giving back or whatever, you know, living their life and going on trips and adventures? What, what's your philosophy there? You know, um, the trouble these days is you don't know when you're going to die. You make certain assumptions and then you live an extra 10 years or 20 years and you live at a time in your life when you really needed that money for your comfort. You know, it's, it's probably better to not make an assumption, oh, I think I'm gonna die when I'm 88, because you don't know what technology is gonna provide or what your genes really have in store for you. I would prefer to die with a good chunk of dough in the bank and then gift it to a cat. <laughs> a cat? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Cats only last 14 years. It'd be a great 14 years for them. I'm just kidding. I'd, give it, I'd probably give it to a combination of, um, you know, in my case, I feel safe because I can roll it into a trust that doesn't provide for you after, um, you know, you finish college. So I don't feel I'm entitling anybody or cursing anybody's future. So I'll just probably roll it into one of my family trusts and say I don't need it anymore. The only thing I'm taking with me to the afterlife is my watch collection, all of them. <laughs> and I'm, going, I'm going to eternity. I got a lot. I don't even say anymore how many I've got. It's, I, I haven't, you know, really, I'm very proud of my watch collection and it's a incredibly, it's, it's got some amazing pieces in it. It's taken me years to build this collection and I'm going to need it to tell time in eternity. So I'm taking it all with me. <laughs> what do you think is the best investment you've ever made in yourself? Well, the best investment I ever made in myself was myself. Um, you know, I, 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 you often doubt yourself, but, you know, it, it was, it was, you know, I went through some very tough times, right from when my mother cut me off through several business ventures I failed in. Uh, and then you just don't know, serendipity knocks on the door. The thing is, is as an entrepreneur, you just got to keep getting up every day. You have to stay in the game, you have to stay in the race. It's very, very hard. It's like that story of the guy with his fiance. You know, you just have to focus and you have to find somebody that's willing to focus with you but um, I'm glad I did what I did. I wouldn't change a thing. I've made plenty of mistakes, uh, but I, I, it is who I am today, and I'm, I'm very you know, proud to be able to offer the things I do to my family and, and, and to support different initiatives and uh, charities and mm -hmm. support the arts and collect watches and guitars and cook, and all these things are made uh, available because you know I've been able to focus on being successful in business. And that is the great American dream. It's going to remain that way forever. Um, it's the essence of why Shark Tank works. It, it's, I'm very proud to be part of the platform. I can guarantee you 13 years ago when we started this thing, we had no idea what was going to happen. I mean, it's just, who knew? But now, nine-year-old girls to 99-year-old men come up to me saying, look, uh, let's talk about that deal last week on Shark Tank. And I'm happy to do it. I mean, I think it's it's a wonderful outcome, and we're proud of it. And as we start to work on season 13, I mean, it's, you know, no it's television amazing. show lasts 13 years, practically none, less than 5% of them. It's amazing. So it, it's great, and we're proud to do it. And uh, I don't know, that, that's the whole idea that I encourage people. Don't pursue entrepreneurship out of greed of money. You will fail for sure. 
Because every time I talk to anybody that's had a big liquidity event, I say, you know, did you see it coming? And how, how, did, it, how did it happen? They said, we never saw it coming. We were just working one day and then boom, I was poor, now I'm rich. It, that's always the way it is. It's not that you're saying you're counting you know, your, your dollars. You don't have any until one day, boom, something happens. And then the funny thing is you find yourself right back to work. Before the interview continues, if you feel like you're not living your most authentic life, not leaning into your purpose and not living the life that your future self would be extremely proud of, I've written a new book called The Greatness Mindset. And I think you're gonna love this. Through powerful stories, science-backed strategies, and step-by-step -step guidance, The Greatness Mindset will help you overcome all the different challenges in your life to design the life of your dreams and then turn it into your reality. Make Make sure to click the link below in the description to get your copy today. Okay, let's get back to this video. What would you say are the top three to five rules on money if you could boil it down to three to five? It's a game. The number one rule is it's a game. You're playing a game. It's that simple, you know. Uh, if, you, if you look at it as a game, just like anything, you can get better at it, right? Like I don't, whatever game you play, if you play Uno, if you play Monopoly, if you yeah. play Clue, if you play Fortnite. Jenga, if you play Fortnite, if we, anything you play, you know, you're gonna get good. I remember in my time, I was playing Fester's Quest. I played Zelda. I, Zelda, yeah. I used to play Final Fantasy One, and I would play um, obviously Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat. But it was also uh, what was the Mario Kart? Is it yep, Super Mario yep. Kart? I, and you know how you would do the three yeah, jumps, yeah. and then bam, it's going fast. And I would beat <laughs> this time, 32 seconds. I was so proud of it, but I, I played it 50,000 times, right? right? So the game with money, it's it's exactly what it is. Once you learn how to play the game with money then it has to do with timing, then it has to do with different kind of things. Like, you know, a, a, a year ago, I get a call from a guy who needs cash. I said, okay, so. Like an, he needs an investment. He, he, he has something he has to sell immediately mm -hmm. to get cash in return, mm -hmm. okay? Because he needs the money right away. So I said, okay, so uh, what are you selling? He says, it's the two greatest Wayne Gretzky cards. I said, okay. Signed or unsigned? No, this is a <laughs> PSA 10. 1979 OPG top. Signature? No sign. Uh -huh. But it's the Holy Grail. So wow. the, the, the OPG one sold in 2016 for $453,000. Okay. Wow. And just five years prior to that, it sold for $92,000. So from wow. $92,000 to 451 in 2016, and he calls me. And the top sold in 2016 for $205,000. So two cards combined sold in 2016 for six hundred and. You know, he has them both. He has them both, and he wants to sell it to me. And I said, okay, what do you want to sell it for? He's like, 600000 <laughs> Yeah, he says, of course, he wants to. I said, I'm not going to pay you that. I mean, you know, he wants six hundred fifty. dollars I'm not going to pay you that, but we talked about it. And eventually, he gave me a number, right? And it was still a number. I had to still cough up, you know, a half a million dollar che uh, check to the guy. But we met at the PSA headquarters, classy guy, total gentleman. We sat down, transaction happened, the CEO of PSA came, showed us the poster on the PSA headquarters, I think it's in Newport, of the card is on the wall. It's the most expensive hockey card in the world, right? Okay, no problem. So and you're a hockey fan? I'm not a hockey fan, I'm an investment guy with hockey. But I've interviewed Wayne Gretzky six years ago. Wow. So I like greatness, I like anybody yes. that just goes and crushes it with mm -hmm. their game, right? So I buy this card. So I buy the card, I don't think much of One it. One card, not two. Two cards, it's both of them, I bought both of them, yeah. Wow. So the other guy who owns the card wouldn't sell his card for a million dollars if you paid it to him. So here's what I do so know. two guys own the card. Me and the other guy. There's only two of us, okay? okay? He, you paid a million, he won't sell it to you. So that means there's only one in the market, because it's me, because I'm willing to sell it, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's on eBay, right? If you go on eBay right now, you type in Wayne Gretzky, OPG, it's, it's on market right now for a million dollars, right? Wow. What the, the, the one of them is on the market for a million, the other one's on the market for 400,000. So you asked me for rule of uh, money, I had cash. If I don't have cash like that, I can't double my money that quickly. So we just talked about three of them. Money's a game. You need cash because opportunity is going to come up, and it's a doubles game. So if I a put doubles a game, it's a doubles game. Everything about money is a doubles game. What's that mean? A doubles game to me is I pay you a thousand dollars. Can we double it in six months? No. How long? In twelve months? Okay, no problem. I'll do a double in a, in a year. Here's a thousand dollars. I get a double back, right? So if you take a thousand and you double it every year, what happens? Thousand goes into two, four, eight, sixteen. 3264 256 5 to a million. $1,000 is nine doubles away from a million. Wow. Now you take a million and see what happens if we double it nine times. One million goes into two million, four million, eight million, 16 million, 32. 64, 128, 256 5 to a billion. A million is 
10 doubles away from a billion. But how do you find the doubles? Well, that's the game. That's the part of the game. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So the, so the doubles now becomes investment opportunities. You know, what you buy into. Do you start a company where it has a high value, you know, you can really scale it and finding something that can scale? Do you invest into things that are gonna give you six, eight, 10 percent, or are you gonna go play ball and take the risk? That, that's the game that you're gonna start learning that, you know, part of my money is gonna be hedged and I'm gonna buy some gold because I'm not gonna become a billionaire off gold, but I'm buying it because gold is money and something happens to the economy. I'm protected with the gold. But you know what? I'm gonna put some of this money in mutual funds because I know long term I'm gonna make eight to 12 percent on this. I'm fine with with that I might do a real estate deal because long term I may do some money although right now commercial real estate may be an interesting uh, dynamic because I think zoom crushed commercial real estate the commercial real estate wow. model has it's been crushed yeah. and by the way it may never come back the same way ever again commercial Maybe real 20 estate 20 years from now or something who knows oh, I don't even think I think it's gone really? the, here's what I mean look we have this space right okay mm -hmm. you got this space if, did you get in the last four months how, how long can we got it before COVID okay yeah, so six months before yeah but if you get this today if you get this today right right now office space in Dallas office space nationwide companies are looking at their business models and they're just saying why do I need a hundred thousand square feet of office space why do I need it but if you go out there and you look at the numbers you're like okay I don't know if I'm going to do commercial real estate, you know, but if I find some small, if I team up with an uh, investment banker, if I team up with a guy that's managing money and I go with a VC team and this is a guy that's, you know, flipping opportunities fairly quickly and I dump a million dollars with him and within five years he turns a million dollars into five million, that's five X in five years. That may not be a bad idea. So you got to find those. And they're out there, by the yeah. way. You have to, they're out there. So Ray Dalio plays a game of uh, doubles. Warren Buffett's a doubles game. All these guys are doubles game. And well, the, I was investing in businesses. Yes. I'm a business guy. Yeah. I'm not a real estate guy. There yeah. are people that are, and by the way, that doesn't mean real estate doesn't work. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense for me to say there's real estate billionaires everywhere. Our president is a real estate billionaire. So for me to knock real estate would, would have no value to it. But for me, I'm more about, I have an idea. What are you guys doing? Me and Tiffany are thinking about starting a, uh, a marketing company. Okay, how, how can this thing scale? Well, let me tell you what we got. We got three packages, boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. Who are gonna be target audience? We're gonna be targeting people in this world. Okay, interesting, how much are they gonna pay? We foresee us doing $6 million a year in revenue within 24 months. What have you done to be able to earn this? I'm a Columbia guy, I'm a this, I'm a this. How much money do you need? I need $2 million. I can't give you $2 million. Can I come in for $100,000? I put $100,000. The next thing, this thing sells for $200 million. That hundred thousand dollars all of a sudden became two point two million dollars. That's a victory. Mm -hmm. So those opportunities are out there. You just got to yeah. focus. And then the last one I would tell you with the money. So we talked about what we talked about. Game is a game. You need cash. You it's need a doubles game. Doubles game. Yep. And I'll tell you one more would be you have to be maniacally maniacal about being patient. Mm. I mean, you have to be patiently aggressive. You know, patiently aggressive. It's so tough to do because you want your money to double oh, now exactly it might take 10 years yeah but but if you are willing to do the 10 years it may double 40 times mm -hmm. it may double 30 times you know like when bezos said just hang tight i'm not going to give you dividends just trust me on this trust me on this right and at the beginning if you've heard the story where he goes and raises two million dollars from uh, he gets fifty thousand dollars from 40 people that's what two million dollars mm -hmm. And he gives them 20%. Wow. 20%. He gives up 20% of that He gives them million. 20% just for $2 million. You know what that 20% wow. is worth today? $200 billion. Oh That's the point. So can you imagine 1994 Amazon gets started? Forget about you put 2 million. Just say you put 50 million. Wow. Just put, you put 50,000. What is a half a percent of a, two, of a trillion dollar company right now? A half a percent, you're still a half a billionaire. Wow. Your 50,000 is worth $500 million, give or take whatever the numbers we're doing right. The, the point is, that is a massive victory. The guy who put $10,000 and he gave it to Berkshire Hathaway in 1974, I don't know if you've heard this story. Mm. You know, Warren Buffett is starting, he says, I'll give you $10,000. Never touches the money, goes back to his regular job, <laughs> makes 100 grand a year. You know how much that 10, have you read this article? No, tell me. The $10,000, if you go on Business Insider, you pull it up, is worth 780 today. 780 million million wow. never did anything to it so so that's the part about patiently aggressive yeah it's very hard to do but so the doubles do. get bigger later on not yes, early on the doubles do. are bigger you're 15 20 25. That's what Papa talks about just like his successes yeah. he's, he's lived longer 
You know, yeah. he's just stayed around longer to let the money continue exactly. to compound. Yeah. And that compounded interest is where it's at. What's the three greatest investments you've made in yourself? And would you recommend those same investments in other people? Or what should they be doing in their life right now? So, you know, I will tell you, I went to a Harvard OPM program one time. And I spent... OPM? OPM is Owner President Management Program. So if you run a business that does $10 million or more, you get to go to it. And it's three years of three weeks living on campus, mm -hmm. right? I went there, but I uh, uh, didn't go afterwards for different reasons. But I went there when I spent that $50,000 and I was on campus for three weeks. You spend three weeks with 144 people from 64 different countries. So watch what happens. I'm sitting there, and at this point of the game, I have no idea what it is to be a CEO. Mm -hmm. I've gone from being an employee to a salesperson to a sales leader to a good manager, but I don't know what it is to be a CEO. I have no idea what it is to be a CEO. So I sit next to this guy. He becomes my uh, teammate, my partner. He, uh, he owns the Victoria's Secret of New Zealand and Australia. The reason why I'm laughing is because the last day, eight of us were chosen to go present a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. So he keeps telling me, hey, Patrick, I'm going to kill it. Just watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to scare the hell out of Lynette. I think the lady's name is Lynette because she's the main person that does it. Watch what I'm about to do. So he goes up on stage. Lewis, it's a very simple guy. I mean, good looking guy. But he's not a charismatic anything. He just goes up on stage. He says, let me tell you why you ought to invest a million dollars into my new lingerie line. Uh, he says, here's a PowerPoint. Here's a PowerPoint. You see all the sexy women here? You know what? I think it's more important for you to see this face to face. Ladies? No way. Bring them in. Seven models come in half naked wearing the lingerie. The entire place, all the entrepreneurs are going crazy. But the teachers are furious with them. The ladies are running up, takes her jacket off, is trying to cover all these women. It was phenomenal, right, to see this here. But the point is... On Harvard stuff. On Harvard's there, yeah. campus, right? Think about it. Here's the part. Five years goes by, I'm talking to you about it. That's called marketing, right? You remember it. I remember it. But when I was sitting next to him, I said, I said listen, man, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to learn how to be a good CEO. What do you suggest about being a good CEO? He says, man, I got 7,000 employees and have seven CEOs that report directly to me. I spent three weeks with this guy telling me stuff that he does with his CEO. He's not a motivational speaker. I don't even think he's got a thousand people following him on Instagram. Mm -hmm. He's worth a couple billion. He's not an influencer. But those three weeks of talking to, I was like a kid in a candy store trying to pull information mm -hmm. out of this guy and it was all technical stuff. It wasn't motivational stuff. What time do you wake up? What's your daily routine? None of that stuff. It's what do you do when you're trying to hire a person and you know you gotta give him equity, but you're afraid if you give him too much equity and he leaves early, and you protect yourself that if you fire him, does he still get the other two thirds? Does he still? How do you do this? Well, you set it up this way. What do you do to make sure your attorney that you have, that attorney that you have, who is negotiating with the other attorney, and he doesn't really want to go to court? So behind closed doors, they're settling, and he's not really working on your side. He's working on the other side to kind of speed it up. And he, how do you get him to? Well, you got another get another attorney who holds him accountable. I'm like, these are the things that he said to me that you can't read about right, in places. So right. you said three investments. That's one of them. Uh, Vistage was 100% a great investment because we met once a month uh, for three, four years with a man named John Morris. John Morris is a local guy, Santa Monica a guy. It'd be great for you to get connected with him. We're sitting in a meeting one time with John Morris. And one of the entrepreneurs going out of business, and he says, uh, guys, uh, I got bad news. Because you would start the meeting and he would say, here's my personal life, here's my health, here's my marriage, here's my business, here's my kids. And we would all talk amongst each other. Everybody had to sign an NDA so you don't tell your story. But one guy gets up and he says, guys, I got bad news. I'm about to go out of business. Why? If I don't get a half a million by this Friday, we're shutting down. If I get it, I'll last another year and a half and I think we'll make it. But I'm shutting down. This is what John does. Tell me what do you need for half a million? What are you willing to give up for the half a million? What are you willing to do this? Mm. He says, give me a second. In front of all of us. Why are the money? Calls a guy. No, calls a guy who is in his business, same industry, says, uh, here, good deal. Yeah, take yeah. this call, go talk to him. Terms, boom. Guy comes back ecstatic. By Friday, half a million was in his account. Wow. This is the kind of guy John Morris is, right? So Vistage to me was watching people from different industries every month for nine hours, for one day. Nine hours. And everybody would share their problems. It was 1500 bucks a month, some number like that. 100% well worth. Mm -hmm. If you get qualified to go in because Vistage, you have to do... It's just like Tiger 33. Have you heard of this thing called Tiger 33, I think it's called? It's kind of like you've got to have 50 million plus. Yeah, there's, there's, like, the, yeah, there's yeah. Things, things like that everywhere. This is one of them. We got to reveal kind of your financial plan. Network, you have to know plan, who you like, are. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of that happening right now, and I think it's great. I think it's great if it's by real business people, yeah. not social media influencers. And let me explain to you what I mean by this. 
what's social, like for example, if somebody wants to learn how to create a podcast, I want to go learn from somebody that's run a six. Like I remember, I think you taught a bunch of people how to monetize webinars and podcasts. Mm-hmm. Like you yeah. were the guy that yeah. taught people how to do the webinars. Yep. And they, you made people millions, by the way. You made a lot of people a lot of money with what you were doing yeah. with webinars. A yeah. time that people didn't think webinars had money. Yeah, five, oh, six, seven years ago. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. That, at a time that nobody was thinking yeah. about it, right? So, so I go on. Listen, how, you doing webinars? Why are you doing webinars? Oh, Lewis taught me how to do this. Lewis, Lewis, yeah, Lewis House. Oh, no shit, webinars. Yeah, okay. So, but this is not webinars. This is not. This is about these guys. How did you go from bigger strategy on yeah, everything? This is, yeah. This is stuff that you sit there and you're like, wow, you guys are doing how much per year? $820 million. How many employees you got? 922. How, how many people on your board? Seven of them. How do you handle conflicts? In the, like, this is the stuff that you talk with these guys, mm-hmm. right, at Vistage. So I recommend the OPM program. I recommend the Vistage program. And then I'm an I'm a obsessive reader, man. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know how many articles and stuff I read. So I would recommend subscribing to... When there's like Business Insider that you can pay $99 per year, pay for it. Mm -hmm. If there's a Wall Street Journal that you pay $600 per year, pay for it. If there are these handful of stuff that you can get that's not just the general news, if you spend $1,000, $2,000 on these news sites that are sending the elite articles that's different than the main ones, don't hesitate. Pay for it. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's going to talk about the general stuff. But that additional stuff is written it's by it's advanced stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's advanced stuff. So imagine insider. like insider. It's the insider stuff written by the CFO of Snapchat that's telling you nine ways to protect yourself against cybersecurity that will be boring to other people. But you're looking and you're saying, this was freaking this was legit. So yeah. those those kinds of investments is what I would say to you. And if you're if you lost your job right now, what investment should you make in yourself? If I lost my job right now and I don't have a job lined up within four weeks, that means I have a very weak contact list. Mm. So the problem is a long-term problem. So you are the long-term, if you cannot replace yourself with a job within four weeks, you have a terrible contact list. Relationship contact. Yeah, exactly, because you should be able to replace your job within four weeks if you got a solid contact list. Why shouldn't you be? You should like, you know, a person gets, like we fired a guy named uh, uh, Mark, and he was with AIG for 22 years, and I love this guy. But he just wasn't a fit, so I talked to Mark. I said, Mark, this is not gonna work out, but I'm telling you right now, I got a job for you lined up at Columbus. He says, seriously, I said, interview set up. CEO of Columbus calls me for a review. I said, no question, this guy's a phenomenal guy for you. He gets hired like this within two, you should. Mm. If you have the contacts like this, you ought to be. So if you don't, it means the problem is you either don't have enough value in the marketplace or your contacts are weak. When you think about someone you wanna connect with, what goes through your mind of the the sequencing of how do I reach out to this person? What's I do a lot of research questions? on the person. I do yeah. a lot of research on the person. You're really good at that, yeah. A lot of research on the person. I think people don't know how valuable understanding who someone is and what their history is and what makes them tick. I agree. How meaningful that is when you do that. Yeah, and I, think I it's, agree. You did this when you first interviewed me. You just knew a lot about me and you did research. And I'm like, yeah. man, it takes so much time and energy. And when you're running a business with a thousand employees, oh, you're yeah. doing 10 sales calls a day, you're you know, a husband, your dad, how do you manage mm. building relationships when you have so much going on though? You have no free time. Yeah, so so this this goes into at what level you wanna go to in life. Meaning, mm. there is levels in this game, right? Like, listen, uh, Gary Payton is alpha, but he's not alpha when Michael's in the room. When Michael's in the room, Michael's the alpha. Yeah, he's a little... Kobe's an alpha, but not when Michael's in the room. But anybody else in the room, Kobe's the alpha, including Magic Johnson, mm-hmm. including Shaq. Yeah. But when Barkley's in the room with Shaq, who's the alpha? Shaq's the mm-hmm. alpha, okay? But when Barkley's in the room with a Carmelo Anthony, Barkley's the alpha. Everything's about levels, right? So what level do you want to go to? So if you wanna go at the next levels, it's gonna require you to be a little bit more meticulous and detailed about your strategy, about, uh, 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 the kind of help you're going to need, the kind of research you're going to need, the kind of relationships you're going to need, you know, and then figure out like your schedule. And sometimes people want to have the four hour work week. I'm not a four hour work week guy, but some yeah. people want that lifestyle. And you have to give credit to Tim Ferriss because Tim Ferriss started a movement with a bunch of laptop entrepreneurs all mm-hmm. over the world. And guess what? They love it. Mm-hmm. When I talk to these people that read four hour work week and I'm in Malaysia 
and yeah. look at my life. And I'm making and I a said, few hundred grand a year or a few million a year or whatever it may good be. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. I could never, I'm, I'm a terrible vacation guy after three days. <laughs> I'm a three day guy. Yeah. But I know myself. If I go to, to Bora Bora, if I go to Greece and we have to go after three days, my wife will say, babe, you good? Like, babe, it's three days, babe. She says, I get it, babe, just kind of, and we're typically go because we're entertaining people. We're not going, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're taking 500 people, 400 people, three. so we're entertaining people. It's not like, you know, you're going because it's, when we go, we go, we get our stuff done, and we come back, and we have a great time to get it because now we have a system. When you have kids, it's different because you can go longer with kids yeah. because you're vicariously living through them. I like, yeah. I like going to Universal Studios. I can go with my kids Universal Studios because I see how he looks at Harry Potter and, uh -huh. you know, these spiders and this stuff. It's beautiful when you see their imagination, right? But going back to the question you're asking, mm -hmm. so how do you find time to do research? How do you find time to do all this other stuff? If you want to compete in the top 1% of 1% of 1% of 1%, of 1 the price is a bigger price. And Lewis, there's no way to describe how to do it. There isn't a formula for it. Mm -hmm. You just have to figure out a way how to do it. If it means I come home and I have to watch a person's interview from 11 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the morning, you do. and I come to the office at 8 a.m. to do my interview, and I have to come and go read through 20 pages of notes, I have to do that. Mm -hmm. And if I don't do that, you can tell in the interview. If I do do it, you're like, how does he know that guy's date? Yeah. How does he know when this happened at this time? How do you know when this happened? It's a the, lot of research. The level you know, you of to detail do. and attention, people will remember for decades. That will remember and they'll always think back to, you know, that person really cared, or that person was really thoughtful, that person was genuinely interested in me. And they'll just continue to remember that. And good things will come to you when you come from that place, when you constantly do that extra work to care about someone. So I agree there. Um, what's the question you wish everyone asked you more that they don't ask you? I think the, 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 the understanding of knowing that you know, if I really wanna do something big, what do I do when I'm having the guilt that I get from my wife, my kids, my family? How do you manage guilt? Mm, for example, something big, what do you mean by that? Okay, so for example, you, you really aspire to have your own talk show, mm -hmm. which you should. I mean, you look like a guy that you ought to have it mm -hmm. one day. You're that kind of a guy. Mm -hmm. You need to be on the big screen. You belong on the big screen. You need to have something like that happen with Lewis House. I've said this to you from the first time we sat down. Right. You look like the guy that has something like that going for himself. Montel Williams uh, meets Oprah Winfrey meets, you know, Michael Strahan meets, right, right, right. you know, like Ellen DeGeneres. Combine those combine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Lewis House show on TV, right? Okay. So now if we're together and, you know, it's like, oh, babe, you're working too hard. All this, this is research, all this other stuff. And, you know, you're not doing this with your kids and you're not spending time with this. You're not spending, you're like, oh. The guilt. The guilt, man. So how do you handle the guilt? The, the guilt works in a few different ways. Ted Turner understood who he was. And Ted Turner, uh, his personal life, he'll be the first to say it, was in shambles. You know, he uh, uh, married Jane Fonda, didn't work out because Jane Fonda wanted to go and Jesus changed her life and she became all spiritual. And Ted's like, I don't want to talk about God. I'm just, I'm playing ball, man. Let's go by the horses. Let's go to the Montana place. And Ted had so much pressure on his life when Time Warner bought him out and all this other stuff, but then the guilt comes out, right? Well, you didn't do this and you didn't do that and you didn't do this and you didn't do that. Yeah, but I wanted to do this with my life. So, mm. you know, it, it, that, that stuff is, can you live without finding out your full potential and not going there? Are you okay? Like, there's a story one time I read uh, in a book written by John Maxwell. This I read this like 16 years ago, one of his small books with his affirmations that he had. Mm -hmm. He said, one day a guy goes to uh, heaven, he dies and he goes to heaven, he's meeting with St. Peter's, and he was always a military guy, right? And he always wanted to be a general, and he wanted to be a great general, he wanted to be a general, go in the military, be a leader, but he never did it. So, but he followed everybody's history. So he goes to St. Peter and he says, hey, question for you, St. Peter, I got one question for you. He says, what's that? Who's the greatest general of all time? He says, I'm sorry? He said, who's the greatest general of all time? You really gonna ask me that? Yeah. Was it General Patton? No. Was it Grant? No. Who was it? You. He said, me? Yes. When the recruiter came to you for you to join the army, and if you had the courage to go in, mm. you would have been the greatest oh, general. I, got chills. I have it right now. <laughs> you would have been the greatest general the world had ever seen, but you were afraid. Wow. I mean, listen, either that story makes you so nervous where you're kind of like, I can't do that to myself. 
or that story gets you to be like, well, <clears throat> it's okay if I don't go there, fine. But you're gonna have to deal with that. And whatever you decide to do that's big, there's gonna be sacrifices. Yeah. A bad investment is still better than a smart spend. So uh, wealthy mm. people don't spend money, they invest money. Uh, number two, they also know that money, it, money is not required. I, I think a lot of us, if we grew up poor, we believe it takes money to make money. Our parents told us that. Uh, maybe a grandparent or the neighbor or somebody said that to us because that was their, how they justified not having their breakthrough and getting trapped. They're like, oh, my, the reason I didn't get out. And we, we know, every, we know every, everybody's got an excuse in their lifetime. Everybody uses them at some point in their lifetime to trap themselves. Uh, th this idea that it takes money to make money is not true. It's a myth. It's 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 the number one reason why I did the show, the Discovery mm. Show, to debunk that on TV, that I didn't need any money at all. Uh, they they offered me a hundred bucks. I'm like, just keep it, dude. Like, no, no, we got to give it to you. It's part of the show. And I'm like, I don't need the hundred. They're like, no, but you got to take the hundred. It's part of the show. So, uh, the third thing I would say about wealthy people is they're. I mean, different people have different ways they invest, but they tend to be more focused on the long-term appreciation of an asset rather than give me money this second. And, and I think the get, they're, they're, they're not stuck in this get rich quick thing. It's a delayed gratification. Yeah, they're more like, yeah, I'd rather have wealth tomorrow than rich today. Mm. And, and they do have a distinction between the rich and the wealthy. The, the, you know, the super wealthy are looking to create wealth beyond their own means and needs. Like they're not thinking about their kids, their boat, their plane. I know people think that, but that's not actually true. They're actually thinking about how do I create wealth for a, a lot of people? Amazon's got a million employees. Yeah. Uh, now, most of them only earn minimum wage, but there's some people at the upper level of Amazon that are making fortunes. Yeah, and, I, and I'm curious, you, you wanted to debunk this myth of that it takes money to make money, which is something I heard a lot growing up. And a lot of people think, well, unless I, I can't make it because I can't invest it until I have it. So what were the lessons you learned, uh, you know, starting from essentially zero, having no money, no context, no uh, relationships, no op uh, opportunities in a town that you went to for this show? What did you realize were the keys to actually making money, even if you didn't have any? Well, as you see the show, you see that I actually never make any money, right? So uh, the two girls, they, they actually, try, they, they follow three of us. And the two girls went out and got a job in the first week. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong or my way is more, better or worse, but, but they are strategies, okay? They're, they're different strategies. I was not there to get a job or to earn money. I was there looking for one thing, opportunity. I never spent time looking for money ever the entire uh, 90 days, okay? I'm not looking for money. I was actually looking for contracts through the contacts. I wasn't looking for money because I knew the evaluation of the company in the last uh, segment, an evaluator will come in and determine what my company's worth, my new company, right, that I created. And at that point, I just need to validate to him Dude, my company's worth this based on that. The entire 90 days, I never touched the first hundred they gave me. And this was to prove to people, dude, you do not need money. Like, it's just, it's not true you need money. You do need contacts. You need people. You need relationships. You need people. You need, people. You need the right people, though. The right people that are already in play. Okay? Just because a guy's got money. I remember a, a, a billionaire friend of mine, uh, you know, he could buy a jet. And I said, hey, Bob, should I buy a jet? He said, you should, I shouldn't. Meaning Grant should because, and he's way wealthier than I am. He could have bought 40 of them. He's like, I don't have a place to go on mine. You, have a, you could use yours every day. So you, mm. you got to find somebody that's in place, somebody that not just has money, but somebody that wants to do more with their money. So you'll notice in the first uh, 10 days, I don't spend a any money. I don't spend money on shelter, not on food and not on water. Nothing. Then what I do is I end up accumulating assets. And it's unfortunate that the viewer doesn't see this. Within mm. five days, I have two vehicles. One was given to me by Discovery. And the other one was a $40,000 Jeep that I basically used uh, from Ryan, this guy I met, and told him, I'm going to sell your Jeep. I'm going to drive it around town and put 10 miles a day on it, and I'm going to sell it. Well, that's a $43,000 asset. 
Uh, my truck was worth four grand. I still had my hundred dollars. I lived in a forty-six thousand dollar RV that I was trying to sell. So yeah. Uh, and the, what, what's the other thing I did? And I picked up ten thousand dollars to do in a fifteen percent partnership in the equity of the upside of this guy's company. So literally in ten days, wow. I was accumulating contacts that could get me equity. And the, and the part part of that story is, man, go get you some equity. You know, Jay-Z talks about this. You're getting, you, you know, so many of you young brothers are getting an advance while I'm picking up the equity. Ooh. Yeah, they're trying to get the, the get rich quick. Let me give you the money now. Give it now, to me now. Where the publishers get getting long-term residual income for decades yeah, yeah. off of Ke- your Kevin off Hart. Of your Look work. at what Kevin Hart did with this, with this show, right? He owns that show. He owns the ticket sales. He was willing to promote it, not just be a comedian, where Richard Pryor showed up and got his check told his jokes. Uh, Kevin Hart says, yeah, I'm going to show up. I'm going to tell my jokes, but I'm going to own, I'm going to own the entire platform, the equity. So how do you get someone to give you $10,000 when you have nothing to give them a return? Or what is it that you're selling them uh, a greater promise in return? So what I did was I pitched this guy. I said, look, he's a business owner. He wants traffic in his company. Every, every business owner wants traffic. Every entrepreneur wants traffic to their website. And I said, look, I'm going to drive traffic to your store. He owned a mattress store, big margins. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure you have the biggest weekend that you've ever been here. And uh, I said, if you give me $6,000, I'll take the six grand to the store. In fact, you don't give me the money. Just call it in and approve it. I didn't want to touch his money. I never asked anybody for any money. And I said, I'm going to go run a promotion for you. I'm going to put together the banners, the logos. I'm going to stand out in the street. I'm going to drive the traffic to your place. What do you want, Grant? Uh, Lewis, what do you want, Lewis? Uh, I did that more than once, by the way. What do you want, Lewis? And <laughs> you I, did? Because my name was Lewis, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, dude, I don't want anything. He tried to give me money to do this. I don't want your money. I just want the opportunity. I want to prove myself. Because what I really wanted from him was I wanted him to front the bill at the print shop Mm. so that he could put me in play. Well, I went and ran the whole promotion that weekend. I said, if you if you send them, if you just authorize the spend, I'll conduct the promo. I'll run it and do it. We did ninety one thousand dollars worth of mattress sales. We did fifteen thousand that weekend and then another sixty five thousand over the, the next three weeks. And he's like, dude, you're a star. Now, now he's like, hey, what do you want for what you did for me this weekend? That was the best weekend we've ever had. And I'm like, I don't want anything except to be your partner. So, so you wanted equity? I want to be your partner, dude. And I said, <laughs> I want 15% of the upside of your company. I said, what's fair? He's like, 15%. Everything above what I'm doing now, I'll give you 15%. He, he's the one that made the offer. I said, that's awesome. Wow. And then that's when I said, Hey, can you give me an advance of 10,000 on the 15%? People think that I asked for 10 grand. I actually didn't get 10,000. I got an advance on a partnership, which is even wow. better. Wow, that's fascinating. So you never really a- you never asked for money. You said give me equity with everything. Give me equity, and then once I got the equity agreement on the upside, uh, most people are will- willing to give you this. Because it's more than they've already made. They're already making a certain amount. They've never crossed past that probably in years. So they're like, okay, if you can help me 10 exit, I'll give you a 15%. I don't want a piece of what you're already doing. That's not fair. That's an unfair deal. I mean, you know, people are like, I need to ask for more. Yeah, but you don't want to ask and be look stupid. Like you can't yeah. ask somebody to give you something of a company they already have. Also, it's interesting because, they did, again, they didn't show this. And, and I look forward to kind of breaking this thing down. We're going to actually, I'm going to create a whole platform where I go in and break the show up and show people what they didn't see. When I left Vegas to fly to Pueblo, uh, the production company said, hey, what's your first move? First move, I'm going to the bank to drop off the hundred. Second thing, I'm going to the gym to meet people. Third thing is I'm going to find a business for, for sale and I'm going to see if the guy that owns the company can give me a place to sleep. Those three things happened exactly the way I predicted before I got to Pueblo, before I even knew I was going to Pueblo. I mean, it happened just every one of them.
And then Discovery came to me at four days and said, bro, you got to slow down. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> we don't have a TV show if you keep winning. Right. If you, if you make it happen in two weeks, what are we going to do? I'm like, okay, come out here and watch me throw up. Okay. Come, on, come out here and watch. I'm <laughs> sick. I was sick from altitude sickness. I'm like, what, 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 you guys got to cover how hard this is for me. I'm terrified. I'm cold. My back hurts. I don't have a good place to sleep. I'm pissing in a bottle. And then they cut all that out of the show. So, so um, the point of that story is quit going for some dead Benjamins and start mm. getting you some equity. Okay. hundred dollar bills are dead. They're from the past. Equity is the future. And you're better off with a future if you believe in yourself than you are with the dead Benjamin. What are th some, some things people should be looking for in terms of the right people or the right uh, products or companies to say, okay, and how to position and package themselves to make a partnership equity deal? What should they be looking for and how can they position and package the way you did? Yeah, so like in Pueblo, there's 112,000 people that live there. The average household income there is $24,000 a year. Household income. Like it's, it's one of the most beat up, economically beat up cities in America. They, they were at 8% unemployment when the country was at three. When COVID hit, it went to 22. Wow. Like just ridiculous, right? So now when I'm in a problem environment like that, you have to do the math. So I'm like, okay, there's 100, uh, 112,000 people there. I, I can't meet them all and I don't want to meet them all. I only have 90 days. So then I said, okay, who's got the money in this town? The businesses have the money in the town. This is the unfair advantage I have in this show is that I did not go there to start a new business. I went there mm. to find a business that was already banking. A lot of people think did I started. Did you have that intention before? Uh, 100%. It, I said, I, there's yeah. no way I'm going to start a new business. There's 34 million businesses in America. America does not need a new business. And it's so hard to launch and create momentum, especially if you don't, even with your audience, it's hard to launch Dude, a new business. It is so ridiculous. It is so stupid what people are doing today. I'm going to start a new beauty salon. I'm going to start a new masseuse place. I'm going to start a new cosmetologist house. I'm going to start a new, you got a new idea. Nobody needs it. Like if, if you were an alien looking down at pl uh, the United States of America and saying, okay, what is there too much of? Restaurants, bars, and businesses. There's too many of them. And then, and then somebody, some kid pops up, Paul pops up and says, I'm going to start a new business. And, and the guy from outside the planet is looking down there saying, well, that's stupid. Why don't you just go two-thirds of all the businesses in America break even or lose money? So what I'm hearing you say, Grant, is uh, a lot of people have the dream of wanting to start and launch a business. But what I'm hearing you say is it's probably a lot smarter to go find a failing business or a business that's breaking even jump in, add value, and see if you can 10x that. Dude, that's, that's how you get on planes. That's how you, you, know, you go to the hospital. You need emergency care. You don't build a hospital. You just go to the hospital. You want food, you go to Whole Foods. You want gas, you go to the gas station. It's no different in business. It's a, called a going concern for a reason. Find a going concern that's got a brand. Go in. That's what I did. I just went in and added value. Once I added value, actually, we end up splitting off another business out of that. So, so out of that relationship, your, your first question was, hey, who are you looking for? I'm looking for contacts that can actually become contracts. I'm looking for specific relationships. They have to have money. They have to have credibility. They have to have credit lines. That's the only people I was looking for in Pueblo. Out of 112,000 people, are there 50 of them? I need to meet 50 people that have money, credit, and credibility. How did you feel? Because uh, I saw in you know the first episode that you got rejected a few times. How did you feel from someone who is getting yeses a lot and building their business so fast to go into a place where people just say, nah, I don't believe in you, or eh, you don't seem credible, or how did you take it in security-wise in internally? Well, what, what you, again, you, pieces you don't hear is I was in this meeting and this guy starts flexing on me <laughs> and he literally like I had to sit there and, and, and listen to his, well, I did 30, I raised $30 million and I bought all this and I put this together and I'm the king and la, la, la. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, dude, I'd like to just drop. I'd like, you want to see a flex right now? You know, the <laughs> same day I had written a check for like $45 million. And I'm, I'm having to bite my tongue 
Like he doesn't know I could be his investor. By the way, there was a great lesson in that. Like I was mm. nobody, shaved head, old truck, no name, no social media following. And this guy treated me just like that. Like I'm a nobody. And you never know who you're talking to or who they're uh, friends with or who their family is that could support you potentially. Totally. Like the same day this guy's flexing on me about how he raised 30 million and he's the king of Pueblo and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I mean, like what I had in my checking account that day is Grant Cardone. I, I just wanted to pop it out on him. <laughs> like, like, Shut up, account. dog. What, tr- treat everybody <laughs> like you, you, you never know who you're dealing with. You, you yeah. know, and, and just because they're, they're having a bad day, you, you, one, you don't know who you're dealing with. And, you, and number two, more importantly, you don't know who they're going to become. Mm, yeah, they may not have money yet, but in, in 10 years, they might have a brand or audience or something that could support you. Every accredited investor was a non-accredited investor at one time. Every whale was a minnow. I mean, you've been doing sales for, uh, what, four decades now? You've yeah. Been, you've been selling from cars to real estate to everything in between, you know. 11 best-selling books. You've been, you've been a selling machine. How did it feel to go in uh, without being able to use any of that and go back to kind of the basics of like, okay, I'm a brand new car salesman just trying to figure out how to do this thing. How did you have the confidence or the courage to go in blind and try to build these relationships? Because I had the commitment. You know, I was committed mm. to the, I was committed to the, the outcome I always say, man, commitment comes with, with time and money. The thing that you do extremely well is you're a master enroller, Grant. And I, I believe that we're either ro- enrolling people in our vision or we're unenrolling them in our vision every moment, every day with our content, our posts, our interactions. And we could be unenrolling people in our brand from one conversation or one thing that we, we do to s- piss someone off. Where did you learn the skill of enrollment? of getting people to buy into you and your vision. I think what, what I do is, and I talk about this in Sell or Be Sold. I've been a sales guy for a long time, and I, I just learned early on, and I was terrible at sales. 17 years old, 18, 19, part-time, part-time sales guy, I was, I was awful. When I finally realized that sales was the only job I could get at 25 years old, I'm just like, dude, I just got to tell people the truth because I can't do all these tricks. <laughs> <laughs> the NLP, right. the and, and look, if it works for you, good, whatever. But the mirroring, the matching, they ask a question, you ask a question, the hot potato. I've, I've heard all these <laughs> strategies. And I'm like, dude, I just can't do it. I'm just going to be me. Hey, guys, I'm, I'm moving from L.A. I'm out of work. I'm looking for opportunity. I'm trying to move my family here. My name's Lewis Curtis. Uh, 2008 beat me up. I got to get my family out of LA. Real estate's impossible. I can't buy it there. It's out, priced out of the market. And I'm here in Pueblo because I think there's opportunity here. And that's all I'm looking for. No handouts, no help. I don't, I got an old truck with me. I got no money. I left my kids with, you got to have your story. So people enroll, but you also have to be talking to the right audience. Mm. I only spent time with people that were able, capable, qualified. I spent no time. I was in a meeting once in Pueblo. I walked into the meeting, assessed the situation, and bounced. (laughs) I said, guys, I'm done. I'm out of here. Boom. And I walked out. And and my partner at that time, you'll see it later in the later shows, he's like, what what just happened? I'm like, there's nothing here, bro. There's no money here. There's no no opportunity here. And I'm on a clock. I couldn't tell him I'm I'm on a clock. I couldn't tell tell anybody. So I had these little (laughs) secrets going on. So, you know, how do you enroll people? It's like, you got to get enrolled. Mm. You know, my, my, my personal integrity and ethics is why I can sell so hard. And because I believe in my product, I believe in my investment vehicle, I believe in my company. I don't trick people, screw people. Like 35 years I've been in business, there's not one person in 35 years that says I owe them money. Many of the people that I know who have tremendous amounts of money have huge fears around being poor. Mm-hmm. And so as, as, as an interesting thought, like a lot of people who don't have money see people who have money as thinking differently and they might in that they are more uncomfortable being poor than you are. Mm-hmm. Like it is more painful for them than it is for you. It might be, I'm just being really it real. It might be why some of them are stingy too with their of money. Of course, like, I'm not gonna spend this $5, I'm gonna keep it, you know, they're very stingy with all of it. Two nights ago, I was, we were out with, uh, to dinner with a guy who just got valued at a billion. 
right? And it's all cash flow. It's not one of these software things. Like it's off, like he's wow. getting, yeah, to, like he's making real money, crazy money. And he's like, I'm not going to that gym. He's like, for, for equal, I said, I'm not paying $200 a month for a gym membership. It's, it's a different perspective. Now, I'm not saying I'm that way. You know yes. what I mean? Like I'm okay spending on gym membership. Yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. fine for me. But like everyone has their own things. And like there are these behaviors, like, he got the other guy who had the 250, he got to that point because he lived, he, he squeezed everything out of his business, which made the business so valuable and then he was able to sell it. But like the, the billion dollar guy was saying, he's like, you know what they don't tell you about when you sell your business because he's sitting next to the guy with the 250, right? And he's like, the moment you sell your business, he's like, you have no cash flow. And so he felt that too. He's like, what are you going to do? He's like, you're going to take the money and then what are you going to do? You're going to try and buy more cash flow because you got to replace the cash flow you, you had with the business. You got to get real like, estate assets. You got to do something else. He's like, why else? bother? He's like, I'll just keep it. And so he doesn't have any intentions of selling. And so it was an interesting lesson for me too because like we obviously got rid of our cash flow asset when we sold uh, all three last year. But you got a lot more money, but you don't have the money cash coming right, in. Right, because then it looks like this, this finite asset. The business goes on forever, in your mind at least, right? And so it gives you this illusion of control, this illusion of security. And me personally... Most people wouldn't believe this when I hear it, but like, I'm very risk averse. And so I probably need, like, what's the core changes that I need to have? I probably need to be a little bit more of a risk taker mm. um, than I am. Like, I tend to always take the lowest risk path uh, when I can. Even, even the idea of like, when I quit entrepreneurship, or sorry, when I quit my job to start entrepreneurship, it was because I knew that the path that I was on was guaranteed not to get to me where I want. Mm -hmm. So I had a zero outcome. And that, so this one, even though it was lower, like I had a low chance of success, the other one had a hundred percent failure guarantee. And so that, so it felt like the lower risk option mm -hmm. for my long-term goals to quit my job and become an entrepreneur for that reason. And, right. and so, you know, people are like, I'm really risk averse. I'm like, so am I. Like I hoard money. Like I'm, <laughs> you, I do. You wouldn't spend any of the money from the exit still. No, it's like just sitting in the bank. Nothing. Yeah. We started working the next day. We yeah. didn't even take it. We didn't take a day off. Yeah. We literally sold, wire hit, and we started working on acquisition.com the next day. Let's say you had to um, put your, start putting that uh, cash flow every month into other things, team, yeah. resources, whatever Dead. it is. And that wasn't coming in, and uh, you know, maybe, let's call it a hundred grand a month was coming in with cash flow. I don't know how much it is, but let's yeah. just say that is going into hiring team and other yeah. things to support you getting to the billion in two and a half yeah. years. What would need to shift in, in inside of you after three months of feeling no cash flow come in to stack your bank account in order for you to be okay with it to get to that billion quicker? I would just have to be more secure, just realistically. Like I, I use. What does that mean? Is that an internal? I use, I use cash flow at, from businesses as evidence to the fact that I'm not a failure. Mm. And so I use, I, I've always, like, it, it has been easier for me to change my conditions than to change who I am. And so I have used my material success and accolades to quiet the voices of not being good enough. And so for that, like, wow. me having that, if I have that little voice that peeps up, it's like, hey, look at that. And I'm like, okay, no, no, I'm. I'm okay. I'm not, I'm not that bad. This money you know, just came in every yeah, month. Yeah, no, I'm not checked. that bad. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so, so I'd have to, I'd really have to re-engineer the conversation I have with myself around how I value myself. Wow. Um, Cause then people are like, well, if you, you know, if, if everything disappeared, you know, how would you feel about yourself? I like to think that I would be uncomfortable and then I would change my views, but I haven't needed to do that yet. And so my effort goes elsewhere, right. <laughs> but that's what probably would have to happen in order for me to make that change. Is it a... What is the thing that is you're afraid of inside of yourself? Is it a self worth thing? Is it a, a self love thing? Is it a belief that you're not good enough? Yeah, or definitely you... be a good enough thing for really? sure. Yeah, it's just like maybe 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 I'm maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. Maybe mm. maybe everything that I've been putting on media, maybe my book, maybe all these things are actually not true, and I don't know what I'm talking about, right? Because clearly I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm not making any money. Like so, these things have been. That's why acquisition.com is the other half like the, the actual businesses of acquisition.com compared to the media of acquisition.com, it is the other half because it's the evidence of the fact that the things that I say are true. Because those are getting results. 100%. And they're growing. Right. And yeah. so that way I feel bulletproof when I make when I make the content, when I make the book, when I write the stuff. Like, you know, there's a zillion people who are like, you suck, none of this is true, whatever. And for me, it rolls off my back because I have evidence. Right. And I'm like, no, no, it is true. And here's how. But if I didn't have that, I would probably have to, it's because I don't know what the right call is there. Because if I didn't have the evidence, it would be hard for me to say you're wrong because I don't have any proof that they're wrong. But you and have so, evidence now. Right. And so I have this evidence. So, so how do you change the belief inside that you're good enough with the years of evidence now? 
the question is like, I, have I built a billion dollar thing yet? You know what I mean? Um, and so <laughs> that'll the, be ten billion. Yeah, be- yeah, yeah. Oh, of course. No, but like it's a, it's a fun it's a, a it's a fun convo, and it's great because I it's this was wonderful, Lewis, because <laughs> I get to see my own limiting beliefs. Um, and just for everyone who's listening, like everyone deals with this. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. at every at every level, you're dealing with this of like feeling of inadequacy. You know, feeling not good enough, feeling like you're not smart, feeling like you don't work hard, whatever it is. Like I have that stuff mm-hmm. all the time because you think that the external circumstance is gonna is gonna solve that. And I would say that it does to a degree. It becomes right. a crutch. Right. But then you have this crutch, and then you just tie yourself worth the, to the accolade or the thing rather than still yourself. And maybe I need to do more work on that. Who knows? If you could overcome one thing or eliminate one thing internally to become a better leader to yourself, to to quiet the noise 100%. or help you take a risk in a different way. Yeah. I'm not talking about lose all your money, but totally. take the risk to help you accelerate this. Yeah. And you don't have to by any way, but I just believe that it's possible for you to do that. Yeah. I believe you can be a billionaire in two and a half years. I appreciate it. If you, That's the goal. If you shift yeah. whatever inside of you is holding yeah. you back uh, to get to that space, yeah. what would be that one thing to eliminate or overcome yeah. internally to make it happen? This need for external validation, 100%. The need for external validation. Why do you need external validation? started the question. <laughs> why do you need external validation? I mean, I think part of it's so ingrained in us. If you think about us as kids, right? Like, how do you how do you orient yourself with the world? You get reinforced or punished at all at all phases, directly, indirectly. But you get reinforced or punished, and the things that you get reinforced, you do more of. The things you get punished, you do less of. Right? Like that's just how how we how we learn behavior, how we learn to function in society. Right? Touch that thing. Ah, it hurts. It's that's we got punished. Okay, you know, you uh, your parent tells you to sit down and be quiet and eat, and you learn to sit down and shut up and eat. And then we wonder why adults don't move because we're told to sit when we're running around, right? We learn- or at school, sit down and be quiet. 100%, yeah. and, we, and we wonder why uh, we eat so much when the reward for everything we did when we were a kid was food, right? We wonder these things. So the reason external validation is so hard, at least for me, is because it's how I learned everything, mm. is because external validation Gave you know gave me the the directional guidance of of what's good and what's not, and then as you get older, it's where am I going to get that validation from? And so I would say that my external validation um, comes is still one hundred percent there. It just comes from different sources. So, so I'm more selective on whose validation I want. So how much external validation do you need in order to overcome this belief to go all in and do it in half the time? Yeah. No, I think I, I just I need to be able to validate myself, and that's fundamentally. Ooh. I think Epictetus said this. He said like. If you need someone else's, if you need, he has this quote, it's so good, but it's basically like, you need to be able to give, you don't need to swear to somebody else. You should be able to swear swear to yourself and bear witness to yourself because Mm. your word should be good enough. So you need to eliminate external validation. Right. I, from you feeling good enough. Probably, yeah. It's, that, it's probably that link. Obviously, you need, it's good to have feedback in life. Course, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And so I think that's why it's, it's also difficult for some in general because it's not eliminate or have more of. It's to what degree and from whom and about what. And so then it gets a little bit more complex. But even using those different lenses, I think it's, it's good to unpack it for anyone who's listening, which is like, okay, Layla said this, so this is not mine. Um, but most times when we're afraid of something, it's not actually like this amorphous crowd that we're afraid of. It's like one or two people's opinion. Like it's your dad or it's your whatever it is, right? And you're worried about what they're going to think. And they're not even thinking about you. But you think they're thinking about it. They're thinking about their dad. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? He's, not, he's not thinking about it. Whatever it is, right? And so she restated this earlier on in my, like when we were together five years ago. She was like, are you, and she like made me name the person. It wasn't my dad. It was somebody else for this particular thing. She was like, are you going to let this guy stop us from getting what we want? Wow. And it was like, when I saw it, it was like looking in front of me. I was like, she's like, what if this guy hates you and thinks you're terrible? Is that a worthy enough reason to still keep going? And I was like, yeah. She's like, then let's go. You know what I mean? And so she was very good with that. What do you need to say to yourself every day to believe in, to believe yeah. you're good enough. If yeah. you could say one thing to you that no one else needed to hear, but you needed to hear it from yeah. you, what would that be? I don't know if it would be a saying thing. I don't think it'd be like an affirmation. I think it's just a belief. What you know would what I belie- mean? What would the belief be? Yeah, it, I mean, fundamentally the belief would just have to shift that that the doing this is enough validation for me. Not the results. Right. And that's, all. I mean, fundamentally that's always the, the goal is that you can you can detach the 
the doingness from the result. I think what I've been able to do has been to extend the time horizon between the doingness and the result, but not necessarily fully eliminate it. I'm patient in, ter- in that I can continue to do things for very long periods of time before seeing a payoff. But if I were able to truly eliminate it, I think that would be kind of like a next step. Mm. Then again, it's that borderline on insanity because if you never get feedback on sometimes you're like, maybe I should change direction. But you'll, you'll keep getting feedback though because yeah, you're creating, yeah. you're taking action. Yeah, you'll be, yeah. You know, the more you do that, you'll have more businesses you'll be acquiring, you'll be creating more content, and everything yeah. will be growing at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? 100%. I love seeing you, you know, go through this process internally because I think... I'm open to it. I just want to win. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, I just want to be better. What does winning look like? It's achieving the potential. It's taking all this raw potential. The, 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 the line in the Bible that always scared me the most was to, who much is given, much is expected. And so, for me, I always felt like I was given a lot. You know what I mean? Like I, I was born in America right off the bat. I was born as a guy. I have insane genetics. Like from, yeah. from that perspective, I was a six pack when I was 15. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. um, I, I have a pretty high processing load. Like I can, I can usually, I do okay with complex problems. Um, I, was, I was bilingual at basically at birth because parents talked to me a different language. So that gave me good language abilities. And so it's like these are, these are all things that were given to me, right? And, and, and I was born into like a, a de- you know, from a, from a money standpoint, a decently wealthy family, mm-hmm. right? Um, not, you know, ultra billion, but like never worried about food or shelter or anything like that. Right. And so these are all the things that were given to me. And so to me, I'm like, man, much is expected. Right. And not necessarily that that's, you know, God, whatever. It just, I expect a lot of myself because I see so much potential. Um, and I want to train, like by the time I die, I would like to have nothing left in my potential tank. Um, and it just all have been transformed into, into my reality. Yeah. When somebody is poor, they're a consumer. And they, all they do is they take the, you know, I always tell people we're all financial traders. My people say, I'm not a financial trader. Yes, you are. You're trading time for money. Yeah. That's the worst trade you can ever make in your life. Um, somebody who's wealthy has made money their slave. They're no longer the slave to money. And the way they do that is they figured out how to become an owner. And the way you do that in the most simplistic way, I, I even taught it in my first book, was you have to decide there's a percentage of money that you're going to keep forever. You're not going to give it to Kate Spade or Ferrari or anybody else. You can do that too. But there's a percentage of that income that never will be touched, that you will grow and compound and will provide income for the rest of your life so you don't have to work. Now, when I was growing up, everybody's goal was get rich enough so you never have to work. Now, like all my friends are 15, 18 years my senior. People like uh, Steve Wynn and built most of Las Vegas. He's like 74 uh, Warren Buffett's 85. Uh, Peter Gruber, one of my dearest friends in the world, owns the Golden State Warriors, the LA Dodgers. We're partners in the LAFC football team in LA. Um, brilliant guy, 74 years old. And they're all working harder now than they ever were, and they don't have to work. So the goal is make enough money so you don't have to work, and then you'll do what you love, and you'll pour your time and energy into it. But you have to make that decision. It's the first most important decision is I'm going to become an owner of American business. You don't want to have an Apple phone and not own Apple. And you don't want to just own Apple because any company can go up and down, right? right? You want to own the index. You want to own, you know, a variety with enough diversification. But if you can just shift, and I've taught people who've told me they couldn't, they have no money, they can't save. Mm-hmm. It's really easy once you get momentum. There's yeah. a research project I did with um, a gentleman uh, who was nominated for Nobel Prize on behavioral finance. And what he did was he said, if you can even, you know, you need to save 15% ideally. But if you could even save 3%, because anybody can do that, they right. took a group of blue collar workers in the Midwest and said, we're gonna force you to save 3%, I think it was three and a quarter or three and a half. But then we're, everybody can die, go on a diet tomorrow. Everybody can mm-hmm. save money tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah. So his tool was, all right, you're not gonna to save today, you're gonna to save tomorrow. We'll do the three and a half percent, but then you go to your employer and say, the next time I get a raise, the first 5% goes to my savings account, to my investing account. And then every time you get a raise, you do that. Well, in 14 years, the average person was saving 15%, and the top 40% were saving 20 mm. well, Let me explain what that means. Uh, you and I were together before. I, I, when I'm trying to explain compounding to people, everybody understands it intellectually. But when I ask some of the richest people in the world, what are most investors failing to do? And they all say they're not tapping the power of compounding. So if you're in a situation where, as an example, let's take um, – you're, you've got $100,000 that you've saved, you're 35 years old, and you put it in the market and just leave it there and never add anything to it. If you leave it in the market and you're only being charged 1% in fees, at retirement 35 years later, you got 762000 from that 100. Never added a dime. It grew that much. Wow. 
But if you pay 3% of fees, which is the average most people are paying, when you ask people where they're paying, they don't know, or they say 1%. Because when you hear about fees, let's say a mutual fund fee, you'll always yeah. hear 1%. That's the expense ratio. Mm -hmm. There are 17 other fees. Yeah. So every 1% you overpay, you know, 1% is the average. But uh -huh. If you pay 2 or 3, and the average mutual fund is 3.12, it sounds like nothing, 1% or 2%. But every 1% you overpay because of compounding right. means you lose a decade of income. So the person paid 1% has 762,000. The person who paid 3% has $452,000 and they own the same stocks. It's just fees. So while we compound our interest, we also compound fees. So if you could save 3% and build it to 5, 10, 50, or you start with 10 or 15 and eventually mm -hmm. get to 20, the best example I can give your viewers is that uh, there's a gentleman who worked for UPS who literally never yeah. made more than $14,000 a year. You heard about him in the book. Yep. And when he retired, he had $70 million. Crazy. And he gave away $35 million while he was alive. And the reason was, a friend of his set him aside and said, look, I'm gonna make you rich. He goes, mm. I'm never gonna be rich. I make 14 grand <laughs> a year. He goes, I'm gonna make you rich. I'm gonna make you rich later in life, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna do it by a 20% tax to your business. And he goes, I make 14,000 a year. I can't live on 20% mm. less. And his friend said to him, if the IRS came and said a 20% more tax, you'd scream, you'd yell, and you'd pay it. Yeah, and he yeah, said, right. but we're gonna pay it for you. And that 20% compounded generated $70 million. So wow. for the people that are at home, the sooner you start, the better off you are because compounding does it. I've got an example in the book of a guy that starts at 19. He puts aside $300 a month. He stops at 27. Mm -hmm. So he does it for eight years. He only puts in, I think it was uh, $35,000. Yep. But it's a, and he, it's a million dollars by leaving in the market when he turned 65 and he stopped at 28. He has a best friend that starts at 28 invests his entire life, puts in $180,000, and he has less money at the end. Mm. The sooner you start, the better you are. Yeah. So many questions I want to ask. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> <you> <laughs> So many I want to ask. So what up, is there a way to be financially free just by saying I'm going to earn more every year as opposed to investing every year? Can That's you do it without investing question. at all, or do you have to invest? And when you say put it in the market, you mean put it in index funds? Is what I'm hearing. Well, in the book I explain, you've got to have diversification. Right. And Don't you just throw it in a stock and just no. And what leave most it people yeah. do is they go to a mutual fund yeah. and they think it sounds logical. I'm I'm no good at this. This is yeah. not my skill. A person says you go to a professional who runs a mutual fund. What do they do? They figure out a series of investments to make. Mm -hmm. They put it in the fund and they do it for you. And you think, well, gosh, you know, they're smarter than I am. They'll do well. You assume that, but the truth is, they charge so much. Mm -hmm that even if they did have an advantage, they lose it. I interviewed David Swenson, who's the head of chief investment officer at Yale. It took Yale 200 years to get a billion dollars that they saved. He turned it into 25 billion in two decades. Wow. It's unheard of, he's the greatest institutional investor of all time. And one of the things that he told me, he said, Tony, you just gotta understand something. He said, you're never gonna earn your way to wealth. Mm -hmm. He said, how many people have you seen, movie stars, actors, athletes, you know, the other day, 50 Cent just went broke, right? Yeah. He, made, he made $100 million on vitamin water right. alone. Somebody gave him a tip. <laughs> he made a, and he's, he was had a half, a half a billion dollars, and he's broke, completely Crazy. broke. Mike Tyson made a half a billion dollars and went broke. Yeah. You can understand that a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> but, I think it's 78% of NFL players go bankrupt two years after they retire. And, and the average know. lifespan of an NFL player is three and a half years. So these guys work their whole life. They go through these rough injuries, and they don't know how to invest. So yeah. the answer is... You can make a fortune. Elton John didn't go bankrupt because it's different rules in, in mm. England, but yep. he got in trouble. Who I just saw the other day is, um, what's his name? The Pirates of the Caribbean, what's his name? Um, Johnny Depp? Johnny Depp. Yeah. Johnny Depp's going bankrupt right now. Really? Johnny Depp. He's making like spends, 20, 30 million a year. Yeah, a Johnny movie. Depp was worth $700 million, what? three quarters of a billion. He's <laughs> on the verge of bankruptcy right now, can't pay his bills. He was paying $30,000 a month on wine alone. Oh my <laughs> right? gosh. He spent $3 million to take Hunter Thompson's body, burn it, put the dust into this giant cannon, and shoot his dust into the space, three million bucks. It doesn't matter how much money you earn, you can always get rid of it or lose <laughs> of course, it. Yeah. Buy an island and watch how quick right. it disappears. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. So what I show people is, what you really want to do is create an income for life without mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. The goal, if you own a business, and I would assume a lot of your viewers are business yeah. owners or, yeah. or getting started in business, no matter how good you are in business, think about this. The one universal rule that idiots in finance know is diversification. It's mm -hmm. the only free lunch. You've got to diversify. Because if you put all your eggs in one basket, no matter how good the basket is, 
one day that real estate market, that stock market, that bond market, that collectibles market, whatever you invest in, Ray Dalio showed me statistically, it'll drop 50 to 70% on a day. Now, if you're later in life when that happens, it's over for you. Right. So you have to diversify, and yet most people, they know real estate, so they do it, or they know stocks, so they do it, or they grew up with their, ha their parents flipping things, and it's the wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. So you've got to diversify in order for you to be able to truly succeed, and that's why when you own a business, yeah. if you put all your money in your business, which is what most of us do naturally, <laughs> see a lot of risk. Yeah. you put all your eggs in one basket, and there's things that can happen. I mean. You know, you're, let's say you spent 20 years and you figured out how to put together the ultimate map, you know, and you remember Garmin came out with this thing called the Tom Tom. I don't know if you remember, you used to yeah. put on your, are you old enough to remember that? You used of to course. put on your phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you used to put on your dash. Um, the dash. Yeah, yeah. Cost a hundred bucks. Yeah. It was a breakthrough. They were making like a hundred million or something. Or, yeah, they, they were. were. Yeah, yeah. Six months later, what happened? The iPhone came out with That's Google right. Maps. These little <laughs> bastards, excuse my French, came out with it, put Google yeah. Maps, put their own map on here, and it costs how much? Zero. What's that going to do to your business when someone takes your product or serve and gives it away for free? So I always tell people, competition happens, mm -hmm. technology happens. What you must do is have a second business with, yeah. no, with no moving parts, no people, no time. Maybe it takes you... Two, two, three days a year for two or three hours after you've read the book, mm -hmm. you put it in place and you measure it two or three times yeah. a year. That's it. Yeah. Go on with your life. Now if there's a trouble in your business, you're financially set. I, in my life, I have 31 companies now. We have, wow. you know, what do we have? 1,200 employees, seven different industries. We do five billion in sales. Yeah. I mean, I, that used to be, you know, me and my seminar business. It's grown geometrically. Wow. But with all those moving parts, the only way I've been able to succeed is because I've taken every one of those businesses and I've diversified my assets so that when things were in trouble, I still have enough economics to take care of myself and keep the business going. So everybody needs to create a money machine that works while you sleep, mm -hmm. that doesn't have moving parts, and that's what this is really about. You have a great cartoon in the book um, where there's a kid asking his father, you know, something about like, how do you invest your money or how's the stock market work? And he says, you put your money in at the peak, it starts to go down and lose money. And so you get scared and you take it out. And then someone smarter than you makes all the money, That's something true. like that. So Very how simple. do we, how do, and I've done that in the past where I put my money in somewhere high, it went down and I was like, oh, I just lost a bunch of money. Let me take yeah. it out. Yeah. And then I put it back in another time and I'm like, what am I doing? So how do we, um, invest without fear of, yeah. oh, it's going down, I need to take it out, or like trying to time it. How do we do that? Great question. It's one of the main reasons I wrote the book. Mm. Uh, this, I always tell people, if you just read the second chapter of the book and nothing yeah. else, it'll change your life. And you can do that with multiple chapters, but that chapter is really about teaching people that winter is coming. Yes. We all know winter's coming, you don't have to coin a phrase but that winter is the best time on earth. And I know that's counterintuitive, and I don't mean like being a positive thinker, I mean yeah. pure facts. So in the book, I take you through 10 facts. I'll give you a couple of them right now. Yep. The first fact I give people is, why do people not invest? They're afraid of failing. They, if you're a millennial, right? Mm -hmm. So you grew up witnessing 2008 when yeah, you were still relatively young. How old yeah. are you now? 33. Okay, so you were what, 27? Not, what, 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 what? 2008? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 27, I guess. Yeah, 27, 28 years old. So you're a young man, yeah. and you're watching the world melting down in front of you. Yeah. For most millennials, they are the first generation since the generation that went through the Depression that is not investing at the ratio they need to even close. And they have Boomers more debt than everyone probably, right? With the, all the They have more loans. college debt than yeah. everyone, absolutely true. I have a friend that has $400,000 of debt, well, dental school. President Obama just paid off his debt five years ago while he was still what? president. No. I swear to God. Oh my it's gosh. Like, it's mind boggling. And he had a bunch of uh, scholarships, but the right. last bit, it took him that long. So what I tell them is, wow. listen, debt, paying off your debt's not enough. You've got to become an owner or you're mm -hmm. always going to be in that place. So yes, pay off your debt, but here's what you need to know. You got to become an owner. You got to get in the game, but you got to understand the rules of the game. If you mm -hmm. don't know the rules of the game, the old phrase is you get, you know, when a person with experience meets a person with money, we know the phrase. Person with the money ends up with the experience. Right, right, exactly. Person with experience ends up with your money, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I teach people the rules of the game so they don't get screwed. But mm. the, the most important thing is this. Winter's coming, but people react. So let's take last year. Last January, 2016, we had the worst stock market opening in the history of the stock market. Worst, mm -hmm. first, I think it was 10 days. Yeah. There was a drop of $2.3 trillion with a T. Crazy. 
everybody's freaking thinking the, the bear market's here, the market's over, the crash is here. I think the market dropped 800 points one day, and on that day, all the richest people in the world were in Davos, Switzerland, you know, for the big yeah, conference that yeah. they do every year. And they went there, MSNBC went there, and, and everybody's freaking, what's happening? What are we going to do? And they said, let's go ask Ray Dalio. Now, your listeners may or may not know Ray Dalio as, if, if you're not in the financial business, you've probably never heard of him. You've probably heard of Warren Buffett, but Ray Dalio's done more. You had to have a $5 billion net worth and $100 million to give him or he wouldn't talk to you 10 years ago. Now, he doesn't give a shit how much money you have, he won't talk to you because <laughs> he's got a closed fund. But they go and they put Dalio on television, mm -hmm. CNBC, he's the king. What do we do? And he says, well, you don't need to panic. Corrections happen all the time. Yeah. But you need a strategy that when markets go up and down, you don't go up and down. And he said, I spent 15 years of my life to perfect such a strategy. All of my money's in that plan. And he said, it's called All Seasons. And I've never revealed it before, but I gave it to Tony Robbins. He extracted from me and it's his book. So you gotta go read his book. This is what he says on national television, the day the markets are crashing. And that day, to give you an idea, which is the beginning of February, I think it was nine days into February, the market was down 9% mm. in the first five weeks of the year. Mm. His strategy, which he gave me, which has made money 85% of the time for the last 75 years. Wow. It's averaged a 10% return, just under, and the average loss, out of, when it 15% loss, was 1.6. Right. So if you go to Vegas and you could spend 85% of the time make money, and when you made money, it was 10%, your loss is 1.6, you, you <laughs> go forever. His plan made 2% while the market was down nine. So it was up 11% difference. Now I'm not suggesting that's the only strategy to do, there's many. His is the smoothest ride right. with the least risk. But what it did was, combination of that, and then right after that, I interviewed uh, Fed Chair Alan Greenspan. He was the head of our economy, the, the most powerful man in finance for 19 years, four presidents he was there running. I was just with President Clinton this last week, he was, he was the Fed Chair for him. And I interviewed him for like two hours, you know, or three hours off stage, two hours in front, and I asked him, in the very beginning of this thing, I said to him, I said, look, if you could we put the Fed today, what would you do? And he looks at me and as I said, he leans forward and he says, resign. So I look at that and go, oh my God, I need to write a book that'll free people. So mm. here's what will free you. Everybody's afraid of the crash. So here's what you need to know, two terms you should understand. Correction versus crash. Anytime the market drops from its high by 10% or more up to 20, it's called a correction. Right. If it drops 20% or more up to 80%, like in you know, the, the Great Depression, then it's called a crash or called a bear market, okay? So how often does a correction happen? How, how, how often do we have to be prepared for it? Since 1900, we've had a correction on average every year wow. for 116 years. So when is winter coming? This year on average. Every it's year. like, how often does winter come? You wouldn't be surprised if it stormed and rained. Now some winters are long, some are short, some are harsh, some are light, but winter always comes. So I wasn't panicked when this happened mm -hmm. last year. I'm not panicked whenever it happens because I know it's supposed to be. Yeah. How long does it last? Average, 56 days. Okay, right. so just under two months. What's the average drop during that time? 14% over the last 30 years, 13.5 of the last mm -hmm. 100 years. So I use the more recent one. 14% gets your attention, right? 14% you, you get a little gut check. Yeah, yeah. But here's what you need to know. 80% of all corrections never become a bear market. 80%. Mm. So all this fear, and what people do is what you said you did, is they see it, it's freaking out, I'm losing money, I'm the hell out of here, and they get out. The stock market never took a dime from anybody, only you can take it from you. You sold, that's why you lost, right? Right. So if you look back and say, what was it like in 2008, I can remember vividly being with my platinum partners and saying, you see these $80 stocks, this is six months before the crash. I told them in April, I brought them to Dubai and I said, these stocks are going to go to eight, and some are going to go to a buck. Wow. And by October, and I told them what to do, so they were able to get out. October, I go on the Today Show in October of 2008, and they go, Tony, there's been $3 trillion meltdown. Pump the country up. You got four minutes. <laughs> like, like, Ready, go. That's not what I do, first of all. And I said, that'd be a lie. I'm not going to pump yeah, up. Yeah. At that point, the $80 stocks were eight. I said, some of those, I said, I'm not a market forecaster, but I work with Paul Tudor Jones, one of the greatest investors in the history of the world, in the biggest market crash in history, you know, 1987, he made 200% wow. when everybody else was losing their entire life. And I've been coaching him continuously now for 24 years, every single day. Wow. So I said, I work with the best in the world, and they're telling me based on history in the 30s and history in the 70s, 
this $8 stock, some are going to be a buck. And I remember the day in March of 2009, mm. Citibank, which had been, I think, $70, sold for 97 cents. You wow. could go and take your money out of the ATM. Yeah. It cost you more to take your money out than to own the <laughs> bank, right? And then I told people, it'll jump from 99 cents to six, 10, $12 in a month or two, and it's exactly right. what it did, right? So what you gotta know is corrections happen every year. You got another couple months, you gotta know it's 14%, yeah. and you won't lose because 80% of the time it doesn't go to a bear. Now, what about the bear? The bear market, it happens, to give you an idea, in the last 100 years, every three to five years. You've gone eight without one. Mm. We're way overdue. Yeah. But in modern years, last 30 years, it's about every five years. Uh -huh. The average length of a bear is one year. The average drop is 33%. Wow. A third of those drops go 40% or above. That, I don't care how well prepared you are, that's a scary thing. Yeah. But it is the greatest opportunity in your lifetime to go from wherever you are financially to where you want to be. I hope your audience is listening right now. Hear me. Mm. If you want to leapfrog and you're a millennial and you think there's no future or you're you know, a, a baby boomer and you think you're too old and it's too late, the greatest gift you have is coming. I know it doesn't sound like it. This is not positive thinking. This is the truth. Mm. Wall Street, the stock market is the only place that when things go on sale, people freak out. If I said, you like Ferraris? Sure. If I said to you, Ferraris go on sale for 50% off. Awesome. <laughs> but when I tell so, you Apple's on sale for 50% off, you go, oh, what right. am I going to do here? What's wrong? The whole world's coming to an end. If you think about it, how old are you? 33. 33. So let's assume if you were 35 and you lived to 85, you got 50, 52 years ahead of you. That means you have 52 more corrections to live through. Right. <laughs> that means you're probably in those 50 years going to have 10 more bear markets to live mm. through. If you're going to have a gut checks every time or you're going to leave out of it, right. If you didn't participate because you thought, oh, the market's too volatile, I can't trust it, all that stuff, you missed 250% return in the last eight years. Mm. I mean, you, you've missed out on everything while you're waiting for things to be better. And if you won't do it when it's like this, when it crashes, you're not going to get in. Sure. So here's the good news about the bear. The good news about the bear, average ones a year. Could be longer, but that's the average. Mm. Could be shorter. But here's what's cool. Every single bear market in the history of the United States has led to a bull market. Meaning, right afterwards. So 2008, this plummeting, what mm. happened in 2009? Up 67% wow. in a year. I can show you every single bear market, and the next year when it comes out, it's this explosion. Now, that's not true in every market in the world. It's true for two centuries in the United States. Wow. So that's why Warren Buffett says, I want to be greedy when people are afraid, mm. and I want to be afraid when people are greedy. If you remember 2008, he was telling everybody, buy. He was having the time of his life. <laughs> buy, 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 everything's on sale. So. Mm. What you have to do to become unshakable mm. is turn, when I always, the metaphor I use is the, turn the snake into the rope, meaning we all know the story, it's the middle of the night, you're walking through the yard or someplace and you see a snake mm. and you're freaked out, you pull back, you come in the morning and it's a rope. Once you know it's a rope, you're never afraid again. What would you say is the difference between a wealthy or rich mindset versus a poor mindset? Is it a way of thinking? Is it a way of acting and being and doing? What's the difference between rich mindset and poor mindset? I, I mean, in an ideal world, it would be those that are wealthy got wealthy because they did a tremendous job of helping, helping others. You invented a cure for cancer. I mean, you say, well, we don't want anybody to be wealthy. Well, don't you want people to invent things mm -hmm. and come up with ideas? Don't you want Thomas Edison to be successful, who invented all these things that make our lives better? What we don't want is people to get wealthy by rigging the system, by, by trying to limit innovation, limit competition, all those things that we see going on in our system, which is what, what we call cronyism and protectionism. That's what we're against all of it, even if it makes us money. We want a system, as I said, a system of equal rights and mutual benefit where people succeed by assisting each other. Yeah. And and so ideally that's the difference, but that potential is in everybody. So for many people today, it's because they were throwaway people. Mm. No one believed in them. With this top down, okay, we're gonna tell you, we're gonna come in and tell you how to live your life and we'll give you money and you'll be all right. So your poverty will be less painful. Mm. 
Where, where's our job? If you empower people, everybody can get out of poverty because everybody can contribute. So how do we find a way to help people contribute? And we've done this, my, my wife and I started an organization here in Wichita called Youth Entrepreneurs 30 years ago. It was in one, one school here in Wichita that was in a poor area. I mean, and these kids, well, I'll tell you a story of, of one named April. This was after we had been doing just a few years. And well, let me tell you this, the program here is what we call three-dimensional education. That is, it's hands-on, it isn't just classroom, it's doing, and it starts with helping them find their gift, turning it into value skills, and then use it to succeed by contributing. And, and, they, and they start, a, we help them start their own small business. And then the ones that have the best business plan, then we give them some seed capital, not a lot, maybe a thousand dollars or even a few hundred. So they can start and they start doing it. And, and so the, then the top performers speak at graduation and this, this girl, April, I'll never forget her talk. She said, I grew up in a terrible area. My mother was an addict. Uh, my, my brother was, had been shot. My sister was in prison and I thought it was hopeless. So I was failing everything in, in high school. And she said, and then I heard about this class where I could get some money. She said, well, I'd like to get some money. And she said, I got in there and I found, wow, I've got to have a winning business plan and a successful business. Wow. So uh, I've got to, to learn to read and write and present. So I better start doing that. And then if I have a business, I got to do math mm. to know what's working and what's not. And then if I got to, if I want customers and employees, I've got to learn to treat them with respect. So she said it changed my whole life. And I went from failing everything to getting straight A's. Wow. And then she got a scholarship to college and, and I've kind of lost track of her, but she had a successful business of her own. So that's, we, that we see that story. I could tell you dozens of stories yeah. like that. So that's the difference. These people who grow up in these, in these areas where they have bad educational system, a bad criminal justice system, all other problems, people in the community hurting each other, drive-by shootings and stuff. So they're, they're, everybody's scared. Uh, so they join gangs out of self-defense. I mean, we've got to help them. We have to have, and we do, we have social entrepreneurs yeah. working this that are transforming lives. As a former athlete, I'm a big fan of visualization of seeing the results I want to create on the football field, right. on the basketball court in the future. But I've always been a big fan of visualization. Every morning, thinking about what, what do I want to create for the day? How do I want to show up? When something happens, how do I want to respond and react? And for me, I find that visualization has been really powerful for my life. Is this something that you do in business relationship or deal making when you're about to negotiate a deal? Do you visualize the outcome? How is that? In your life if it's yeah there. but i i don't not with not i mean you in, in in football it'd be the image or, or like a chess player mm -hmm. visualize okay the moves 10 down what if it does the yeah my opponent does this so that's a different i don't have that but i have one for okay what are the principles involved here what are the concepts and okay what do we need to do to apply those concepts apply these principles and we because we find when we violate these basic principles of of human progress we fail mm. we, we don't think we're doing it because we're going through the motions and we're using the right words and all stuff but we're not really doing it and mm. so that's we need constantly have these checks and and why we need this challenge continual challenge culture from everybody and so it, like if you're a supervisor here and your people aren't challenging you, we'll go I'll help you. Now, you're, you're not getting their knowledge. So you cannot succeed if you're only using your knowledge. Those people out there doing the work see waste and see better ways that 
that I I will never see, and right. even you as their immediate supervisor won't see. I mean, the thing to visualize is how do we better empower our people mm. so they come up with answers rather than me. And so those are the things I think about. When you were in your you know late twenties and thirties, did you ever dream or imagine that this is where your life would be now, and this is where your business and uh, visions and, and, uh, nonprofits would be at, is that something, was that ever a dream or were you just like, oh, I hope to just make some money and have a good family. And that's, that's why I say this philosophy, these concepts have enabled me to achieve more than I ever dreamed and totally transform my life. And it's, and we raised our children with this philosophy, which I, I, I talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, this is so powerful. And then to, to have the, the luxury of seeing what it's done for so many other people's lives is yeah. just, I mean, as you can tell, I'm pumped up about yeah. it. Yeah. How do you, you, you talked about your kids. I know you have a great relationship with them. How do you not, for all the parents listening and watching who have generated some, some success or some financial abundance in their life, how do you not screw up your kids when you have wealth? How do you keep them humble and grounded and hardworking and committed to growth and self-actualization when they essentially have everything at their fingertips if they wanted it? Well, that's, uh, I mean, I learned that lesson from my father. He exemplified integrity, humility, mm -hmm. treating others with respect, hard work, lifelong learner. Like he would say things like, son, learn everything you can. You never know when it'll come in handy. Mm -hmm. And on every one of these uh, issues, he would he would talk about it and he would do it. I mean, he worked all the time, just like I do. And he, boy, when we didn't treat somebody with respect or like we were waiting in line for a movie together and we'd say, okay, there, it's kind of crooked here. Maybe we can move up. Hmm. Well, he would come and grab us. You go back to the back end of the line. Wow. I mean, he was a bear. And you, if you bragged about anything, well, you would get smacked down. And if you talk bad about any person, oh man, I got the belt a few times. <laughs> so he was pretty disciplined. So, so we, I mean, we weren't, we weren't as tough on our kids, but we talked about this every day. For example, the school had, had the kind of the five values, love, courage, faith, honor, and loyalty. So every night at dinner, I would have each one to, to, they could, you could pick any one of these five and, and then you would, uh, you, you need to tell me how you exemplified that with a specific example. And at first they were fresh, they'd cry. This was starting in the first grade. <laughs> and so that was a little intimidating, but after they got into it, it's just like with our employees. Okay. You go help others succeed. You go create value for others. And, and obviously our best customers are those who reciprocate and who reward us for it. So that changed me. And then every Sunday evening, I would take them in my library and play a tape for like 10 minutes, whether it's Maslow, Aristotle, wow. Hayek, all, all across all these disciplines that I had learned. I had tapes on them and play it for about 10 minutes. And I knew that was their attention span, yeah. <laughs> Max. And so then, we'd just have a discussion and my daughter picked up on it. I mean, she was eager. She was doing it. My son was, he was more like me. He was, <laughs> let me go play dad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got, I got important things to do, but then he's gotten it. And he, and now because of this and this business of, uh, of finding your gift and then developing and using it to help a boy, they are both doing that. Like my son has, um, uh, has started a business here uh, called Coke Disruptive Technologies, and he's now has investments in 10 companies. And we do that through the philosophy of mutual benefit, because mm -hmm. there's all this money rushing in for hot technologies, but we're a preferred partner because we say we have all these businesses and, and some of them it would be a good pilot area where you can apply it. And then our people will work with you to show you how to make it work better because they'll be the ones applying it. And that's what we call Coke Labs. So our whole, all our businesses, we look at laboratories, Coke, Coke Labs. 
and then in stand together he's he's built these relationships with all these technology uh, entrepreneurs and so now they're working with us on stand together because they've made money and they want to have meaning in their lives so we can help them find what they're passionate about and where they can make the biggest contribution wow. yeah. so he's done that way beyond what i could at his age and then our daughter well she she was frustrated for a long time like i was couldn't find her way now she she started an organization called unlikely collaborators and they get together and she finds people who who are frustrated about something have a hang up maybe they're bitter so they go through these sessions well she starts it with telling about all her problems and her failures mm -hmm. and of course then that opens them up and they talk about it and she's totally dedicated to helping people and she's working with us she's helping show us how, how what she's learned out on on helping people in ways that we haven't used i'm curious about your non-negotiables on a daily basis do you have a list or things that are non-negotiable that you do maybe it's you get up at a certain time or you always take a walk or you eat a certain way is there anything like that you do or you always give your wife a hug and a kiss is there something you always do non-negotiable yeah i work my mind and body every day hmm. every day i'm going to learn something that i will help me contribute i'm going to find a way to contribute and i'm going to work out because hmm. i've got to stay in shape to do all the things i'm doing yeah that, so those are those are my primaries and that's what keeps me alive what do you what do you feel is missing in your life the ability to move our society better in a direction of equal rights and mutual benefit where people assist each other because it's gotten so divided mm. and these ad hominem attacks and and no one talking about as we said about okay let's find ways to work together to empower people help people rise particularly those who are starting to nothing rather than like an occupational licensure okay will all the business people in the community get together we're going to make these rules so tough that these people starting out can't compete with us i mean that's monstrous mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one of our, our key issues. We got to get rid of these regulations like that, that these protectionist cronious regulations that keep people back and slow down innovation, undermine competition, undermine opportunity. Yeah, that's yeah, it's it's hard to hard to overcome all that and hard to make it all happen in a powerful way. Yeah. So well, that that's my biggest frustration. I'd like to wave a wand and bring it on <laughs> Figure that out, yeah. <laughs> i'm not a utopian i mean we'll never be perfect yeah if we move 10 percent in that direction like re reading history this this would make a massive change mm -hmm. just 10 percent improvement in those principles of human progress yeah and i'm curious what do you think is the biggest fear you've had to overcome in the last 40 years and what is the greatest fear you still face today well my my fear is always that uh, tomorrow i won't be able to contribute mm. I, I lose my what which i mean as you get older you you lose some of your capacities and then i'll lose it and i won't be able to contribute because then i might as well you might as well just throw me in the ditch and and cover me up how do you manage that fear well i the way I manage it is every day contribute. Yeah. And if I contribute and I'm, I can still offer something to help and I'm still making a difference, then okay, I'm good to go. Yeah. Now I gotta, now I gotta work on how I do that tomorrow and maybe next year, God willing. In the previous interview we had, we talked about mindset versus tool set where most of the times we assume that the reason why we can't become successful is because we lack the tool set when in reality for 90 percent of people it's lacking the right mindset